Hello everyone and welcome to Time with Pastor Otabel, our interactive discussion program that gives scriptural perspective to the big issues of our lives. My name is Kwejo Amu Asari Jr. welcoming you on behalf of Dr. and Mrs. Otabel. And today we'll look at the big subject, choices and habits. And helping us to lead the discussion is Dr. Mensa Otabel as always. Doc, you are welcome. Thank you. It is an honor to be hosting you today. I'm extremely grateful. And to my colleagues, Pastor Albert Okran. Pastor, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And Pastor Priscilla, you're welcome. Thank you. Doc, why is choices and habits such a big issue, especially on the year that we seek to be extremely fruitful? Um, Everything we do in life is a result of our choices, Um, whether it's to receive salvation uh, through Christ, or to live the Christian life, or to live our lives in general. Our choices put us in a position to determine the path we are, we are going to take. So in a year where we have chosen fruitfulness as our theme, uh, every action we need to take to become fruitful uh, is something that uh, will require uh, a choice that we make, uh, a decision that we make uh, to, to get there. So why is making a decision such a big issue? Uh, because of options. Because we don't have only one thing in front of us. Uh, in life, you have different paths, different options, different ways. Uh, of going to where you intend to go to. And not all the ways or the paths will get you there. So sometimes there, there is a, a way that seems to be the right way, but when you take it, uh, it takes you uh, opposite of where you want to get to. And because of options and the attraction of the options, uh, making a choice is always a very difficult uh, endeavor. We hope to get answers in this discussion. Hopefully. Concerning choices. One school subscribes to free will. Mm -hmm. Others um, tend to predestination, suggesting that irrespective of our plans, God's counsel will stand and he will do as he pleases. What is the scriptural position on free will Uh, and predestination? I mean... God God knows all things, but he hasn't willed that everything should be as it is. Um, He has his will, he has his intention, he has his purpose, but man also has a will. Um, And that, that is the difficulty we have as human beings. There are two entities that have will and exercise will. And, and it's God Almighty and the people he created in his image who also have a will. So in doing the will of God, we always have to bring our will in alignment with the will of God. In other words, we can choose a path that is very opposite what God wants. Other beings don't have uh, that choice. Uh, they, they just have to do what has been willed by God. But for us, we have to uh, submit our will to God. And if you would uh, remember, the first responsibility God gave to man was a choice. Uh, he placed man in the Garden of Eden and says, I've placed before you options. Uh, if you want my will, this is my will. This is the tree you must eat off. This one don't eat off. Uh, and then the consequences. But he doesn't force them. Uh, and that means that in as much as God has a will for us, uh, we also have a will and we can choose to go against the will of God. And unfortunately, in the first experiment, uh, we chose against the will of God. Uh, but God still had to work with us to bring us into his will. It takes a process to get human will to conform to God's will. Uh, but uh, God has a purpose for us but he doesn't force us into into his purposes. So then there is no conflict 
God has a purpose, his will for us. And he expects that we will take decisions and make choices to align with his will. There is, it's not free will versus predestination. You can say it is versus, but um, the, the reality is that God has a plan. I mean, you can call it predestination. Um, predestination simply means that somebody has decided a destination ahead of time. Uh, so it's like uh, if I tell you, Pastor Presler, uh, I want you to go to Kumasi tomorrow. And uh, this is the ticket for your bus. And this is the place you're going to stay. And I want you to take a message to the pastor in, in one of the churches in Kumasi. Now, that I've determined your destination for tomorrow, that you'll be in Kumasi. But you can also take the ticket and everything and decide to go to Takuradi tomorrow. Uh, so then you've exercised your will against my predestined place for you. Now, if I have the power, uh, then I would say that whilst you're going on Takuradi uh, Road, I would uh, uh, still be speaking to you uh, so that you will be convinced to repent and get back on the road to Kumasi. But instead of using the regular route to Kumasi, you may use another longer route, but you still get to Kumasi. So that, that's how uh, God's will and, and our purposes work. Almost, almost sounds like Jonah, the story of Jonah. <laughs> it does. It does. I, I mean, God uh, willed for him or destined for him to be in Nineveh. And he took a boat going the opposite direction. Uh, and uh, God, who owns the elements, uh, uh, made the elements act in a way that will bring Jonah to a point of repentance. Repentance meaning, simply means that you have a change of mind and you realign uh, with the purposes of God. Experts suggest that a person makes so many decisions. Some suggest as many as 35,000 decisions a day. How do we make these deliberately and consciously? I mean, a lot of decisions we make are unconscious decisions. I mean, we are, we are making thousands of decisions right this time. Even when you ask me a question, I'm processing the question and I'm deciding how I should take it, how I should answer it, how far do I go, how much information should I give or how less. So all these decisions are taking place without you actively thinking you are making a decision. Or you get up in the morning, uh, you go and brush your teeth, uh, have your bath, uh, wear your clothes. I mean, you're making all these decisions without actively uh, being conscious that you're making decisions. So those decisions are important, but they are not as important as the ones where you have an option placed in front of you and you are intelligently and intentionally trying to determine which, which way to go. So um, the ones we are not conscious of, I will not be too bothered about them. Uh, yes, they can affect us, but they affect us based on habits we have developed over time. But um, the ones that we think through, uh, those are the very important decisions. So you must be aware of those important decisions and make them a bit more deliberately. Yes, and um, most times you would even know it's important. I mean, um, if, if you are going to work and you go and stand by the roadside to take transport and you know that the taxis or the transport from this side of the road are going opposite where your office is. I mean, you, you have to go to the side where you get the transport that takes you to your office. So that's a conscious decision you are, you are making. And you go to the office and you're given an assignment and the assignment, maybe three assignments, and you decide, I'm going to do this the first time and then I'll follow up with this and do this the third. Those are also conscious decisions you're making. And then, of course, there are the big ones like, whom should I marry? Uh, uh, which, which are huge yeah. uh, life-changing decisions that, that we have to make. Doc, what parameters influences our choice preference? Um, mostly, we make choices and decisions based on what is comfortable for us, what we find comfortable. Uh, so you, what you have trained yourself to be comfortable with is, is going to play a very important role in how you make your choices. 
So if, for example, um, somebody wants to lose weight and uh, he knows that for him to lose weight, he, he or she has to stop uh, eating sugar uh, or eating bread. But he hasn't trained himself to live with that discomfort. So although there is a great desire to lose weight, uh, this discomfort, this thing he can't live with, not eating bread, would undermine the desire to lose weight. So ultimately, you find that there are things that we find ourselves un unable to stop because we can't live with the discomfort that it brings to us. And it, it, uh, it touches on your decisions and the choices you make. It means that discipline is a crucial issue. Uh, discipline is, but also what you've trained yourself to do over time. You know, because sometimes we train ourselves to do some things over time. Like a soldier who has been trained over time to handle a lot of discomfort and a lot of stress. Uh, if he's given an assignment that requires that level of discomfort and, and stress, he will do it because he's built that ability in himself to do the job. So the, the things we prepare ourselves to do help us in the future choices that we have to make, especially the big choices uh, that, that we have to make. Doc, looking at the analogy of the ant, like it came up last week, what are the small steps or the small decisions that we need to take to be able to build the tower that we so desire to build this year? Well, I'm, I'm the, the, in terms of the things we want to, to achieve, achieve in life, yeah. I mean, every, everything, no matter how big, can be broken down into little pieces, no, no matter what, how big it is. A building can be broken down into blocks. Um, our body is broken down into cells. So everything has a very uh, manageable level to start with. So... Depending on what a person has decided that they want to do, uh, there's always a step they can take. Uh, and the first step they can take and the second step they can take. What we need to be careful uh, of is not to create a big image of what we want to do without also creating the small components that are easy for us to, to take. And if the, what we want to do is so big, uh, the vision is so big, the desire is so big, but the small components are not known, then you all only stare at the big thing, but you, you never um, do the small things. For example, you want to make a, a lot of money is maybe saving uh, one CD a day. It can be how you accumulate uh, your resources um, or you want to be able to uh, change something about your life. Maybe you want to lose weight uh, just walking a certain distance every day is what you do in order to get 50 pounds or 20 kilos of your, of yourself. Uh, but if you're looking at just trying to crush 20 kilos off and so you go to the gym and do an extra work one day and hope that one day 20 kilos will, will melt from your body. You know, uh, it took a long time for those kilos to come. It's going to take a long time for them to get off. Desire big things, but don't ignore the small component. We are taking a small break and we'll be back in a jiffy. Be inspired every morning with Word to Go by Pastor Mesa Otobo. It's online on my ICGC app, Facebook, and YouTube at Mensa Autobill and at ICGC Christ at 5.30 a.m. We are also now on Joy 99.7 FM at 5.45 a.m. and on partner media platforms at scheduled times. Worship with us in person every Sunday at ICGC Christ Temple at Abosokai, Accra, of the Kolibu Road. You can also join us online or on air on various television, radio and virtual platforms. First service, 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Second service, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Welcome back from the break. This is time with Pastor Otabel. I want you to call a friend, to call a friend, to join in this discussion. It has been insightful so far. Pastor Prisla. Doc, there are issues about intuition 
and impulse. What do you think the merits or demerits of a decision purely taken on intuition or on impulse? What would you think? It's a very interesting um, discussion on what constitutes intuition um, and whether it is divorced from you totally. Um, there, there is a level of intuition that I would say is spiritual. And at that level, you can say that what you are being led to do is outside of you. And then there is a level of intuition that is personal. Uh, that, and, and that's what I was trying to explain earlier about what you're comfortable with. Uh, most times, you, you have intuition to do what you're comfortable with. And that is why if, if you don't deal with the base, you may find yourself always intuitively doing something that probably gives you the wrong results, but you find yourself unable to change it. And especially for Christians, when they put a spiritual label on that thing they call intuition, because if you put a spiritual label on it, then you would say, the Holy Spirit told me, or God told me, uh, or, you know, you put a spiritual language on it. One, once you put a spiritual language on those kinds of things, you are imprisoning yourself into a mold that you can't judge. Because who are you to judge if it's the Holy Spirit? It's better to develop language that does not imprison us. Uh, you can say things like, I feel like, or this is what I'm thinking of. Uh, even if you think it's the Holy Spirit, give room for review. After all, the Bible says we, ju- we should judge the spirits, including what we feel spiritually. So um, I would say that intuition can be a very a powerful uh process for decision making some some great of the great decisions in the world have been made intuitively but it's also because the people have conditioned themselves uh to act that way so it's almost like a chemical reaction uh you have the components together already so they come together and form something else which you call intuition um and that is not to say that the holy spirit doesn't lead us he does but if I'm to put a percentage on it, I would say that about 95% of the intuitive leading we have is not from the Holy Spirit. It's just the way we've been conditioned and we've conditioned ourselves to make decisions. So how do we work ourselves out of it or to be more flexible? My, my thinking is we have to evaluate our decisions and the outcomes of our decisions. So... If I felt this way and I thought it was right, and then I look at the outcome of it and I definitely know it is wrong, I would then begin to question what I felt from the beginning. You know, self-doubt is very important. Not the, the crippling type, but the type that helps you to always refine the way you think, the way you act, so that you are able to judge yourself. The Bible says if you judge yourself, you will not be judged. And, and being able to judge yourself uh, is, is, is so important. And, and so you look at the outcome. For example, for somebody who said, the Holy Spirit told me to do this. And, and you did it, and obviously the answer, uh, the, res- the fruit of it was definitely not the Holy Spirit. You don't go and say the Holy Spirit told me again the second time. You have to now start being more measured in understanding this process that is helping you to make a decision. Okay, what about impulse? Impulse. Uh, impulse can also be good. I mean, it, it's almost like um, things that people have been trained to do already. They, 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 they have the skill for. There can be a moment where you don't have the time to process all the steps you need to take in order to make that decision. So you make that decision very quickly. But that quick decision-making is not from an empty space. 
It's from a place that you have taken time to really work yourself through. So although the process is quickened and it may seem hasty, the base of it is very solid. It's a very solid base. So uh, impulsively, uh, people can make very, very good decisions. And it's also because they have learned to, to process those. If they haven't learned it, their impulses will always be wrong. So, Doc, in that case, you see the learning curve has been shortened. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the acting curve, the acting process. So, if he had to say, okay, what, is, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, before he makes up his mind, he makes up his mind without asking what do you think, what do you think. Mm. But because the base is already good, most likely that impulsive decision would be a good one. But if the base is wrong and he doesn't really have a clue about what he's talking about, that impulsive decision will be calamitous. Doc, in your way to go last week, you highlighted one of the most important bases we need for decision making, which is the word of God, and encouraged us to meditate on it and delight in it. How can a person make that a routine in 2021? I spoke about five things. That we have to read it, we have to study it, we have to think it, and we have to speak it and do it. Um, the, the reading of the Bible is good. A lot of people do it, and some people do large volumes of it. Unfortunately, most people don't study they don't go beyond just the surface information they are getting to understand the context in which that passage uh, comes to them, how it relates to other scriptures, what does it reveal about God, what does it reveal about man, what does it reveal about God's nature, uh, God's dealings with man. I mean, these are questions you are asking yourself when you are doing a Bible study. Because over time, when you do that, you have a clearer picture of who God is who man is, what are man's limitations, how does God relate to man, under what circumstance does God do this, and under what circumstance does God not do that. That doesn't come from reading, it comes from study. Uh, but the thinking is when you allow the word to settle and actually become a part of you, so that the word of God or the Bible is not an outside force. It's now internalized. It's now become something that lives in you. And it is from that point that you really begin to see uh, the, the Bible shaping your thinking, your decision-making, your analysis. Uh, and although you may not say the Bible says or be quoting verses, uh, you find that your thinking is being processed to function in a certain way uh, that is in conformity with, with, with the Scriptures. So when you face a decision without... Consciously saying so, you would ask yourself, what does the scripture say? Yes. Just, just like we're talking about impulses, the, the scriptures become part of your impulse. And, and so um, you are always filtering everything from that point of view, from the scriptural point of view. What does God say? And, and you may not be going through all that step by step, what does God say? But quickly, that is how your mind is working. So that's how you process your decision. That's what you call the base. Yes, yes, getting that at the base of you so that when the time comes, that's not the time you go and pick a lot of Bible verses to go and, and, and read and memorize because it's decision-making is crunch time. Right? And you should have been prepared for the moment and then you draw from the wells of, of living water that is in you to, to, to speak to the situation. Doc, evidently that takes a lot of time. So for a new believer, what will be the parameters that will guide you to make decisions if you have not assimilated a lot of God's word in you? Uh, unfortunately, you cannot inject the word of God into, into yourself. So you have to study it. So for the new believer, they wouldn't know. The, all they will have will be their experiences, uh, their cultural experiences, traditional point of view, academic knowledge, which are all good, which are all good. I mean, it's not as if having academic knowledge is bad or having a traditional understanding of something is bad. They are all good. But when you're a Christian, you must have a system that is higher than all of these so that your academic understanding, your traditional point of view, uh, your experiences are now formatted in a certain 
different way that the Bible or the word of God formats all of it. So, uh, as a Christian, you don't want to become different parts. You know, part of you is traditional, part of you is, uh, academic, part of you is Christian. Uh, you must be one whole and the binding force that helps all of these pieces to come together is the mind that you have submitted to the word of God. Doc, so, um, you know, most people, until a bad decision stares at them, they are unable to know the impact of the consequences that will derive from the choices that they've made. Is there a blueprint that you can share that probably could guide us on a daily basis when we want to make any decision at all? I don't know whether there's a blueprint. Uh, all I can say is that we have to be aware of ourselves and we have to be aware of things that happen to us and things that happen through us. So you have to be aware of the effect you have on people and the effect people have on you. You have to be aware of the effect of the things you do all around you. I mean, it's, it's something that we have to work ourselves to be aware of so that we don't just do things without seeing the impact it is having. So if I speak to you, I should be able to determine what effect it is having. So if I, I speak to you and I feel that you are feeling discomfort and definitely my words are not lifting you up, I should be aware that I'm making you uncomfortable. I mean, I sh you should be aware. Uh, if I do something to somebody and eventually see that it's really harmed the person, I should be aware that that action is a harmful act. So um, there's no blueprint. We, we just have to follow through and see the impact that our actions have on people. No. That's a Doc, you mentioned that um, some decisions are minor. Yeah. But of course, there are some decisions we have to take that are life-changing. In your opinion, um, what are three major decisions a person must take in their life? <laughs> three major decisions, <laughs> Pastor Presley. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I think the first decision, uh, that this is not contestable, is um, what to do with God. What to do with God? The, the, the question about our salvation and, and the offer that God has made to us through Christ Jesus, whether we're going to accept it or reject it, that's a very important decision. And it's a very important decision because it affects us on this earth and life beyond this earth. So uh, the decision uh, relating to our spiritual life, our walk with God, our salvation is very important. Um, after that... Um, people would say that your choice of career would be your second most important decision. Um, what do you want to do with your life? Uh, how do you want to live your life? Uh, professionally, career-wise, it doesn't mean you will decide everything about your career, but you ha must have a, quite an idea that this is what I want to do with my life. So that's, a, I would say, the second most important. The third would be, whom do I live my life with? I was waiting for this one. You are waiting for that one. <laughs> <It's February. laughs> whom do I want to live my life with? And that is marriage. And uh, for those who have the grace not to marry, and there are people who, are, who have the grace not to marry and can live, very fruitful, productive, happy, uh, meaningful, single lives. Uh, they, they don't, even they have to choose whether that's what they want or they want to partner with somebody. But for those who feel the need to partner with somebody and marry, whom you marry will affect the first two decisions. It can affect your career. And it can affect your relationship with God. So, although you may have made good decisions in the first two, 
this third one can actually derail you and, and misdirect you. So there are people who have married people who took them away from God. And then there are people who have married people who misdirected their lives. So they pursued a new objective for their life that brought them so much pain uh, in life. So because who, whom you marry becomes a very important decision because of proximity. Whether you love the person or not, they are in your face and in your life. And they are the greatest gravitational pull on your life in terms of your choices and decisions. So uh, if they are right, then your, your career will be super and your relationship with God will be super, super. But if they are wrong, then they will affect other areas of, of And your affect life. other decisions to your uh, financial other, planning and others. Yes, yes. And uh, let, let me, well, maybe when we come to relationships, yeah. I, I would qualify what I mean by if they are wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely waiting for that big conversation in yes. February. Yeah. Doc, so in trying to make a quality decision, what factors must one consider? Should you consider your location? Should you consider the resources you have? Should you consider your faith, the consequences? What are the factors that one should consider ultimately making some of these big decisions that you're talking about? I mean, um, for me, what my first and most important is to try and discern what I consider to be the will of God. And I choose my words carefully because arriving at the will of God is not that easy. So it's a, it's a work in progress. So it is trying to discern what I consider to be the will of God. Once I get that right or approximate that, I get to a point where I have a certain sense, I think this is what God wants me to do. The rest of it is very easy because then I know that I'm in the right place. Uh, then I will look at my, my skills and the resources and, and all that I have uh, to do that. But if I don't get that sense right, everything becomes guesswork then for me from then on because then I'm not sure, you know, whether this is what God wants me to do. It even affects my own commitment to, to, to it. So not everybody makes decisions that way. But for me, uh, trying to discern that uh, is the most critical decision I need to make. I can imagine somebody listening right now and seeing, and that is exactly where I got it wrong. Mm. But what should the person do? It's, it's difficult to, to advise people long distance, you know, because you have to also know all the factors that have influenced them. But I, I think as a Christian, the, the most important place to be is the will of God. It's not a physical location. It's not whether in Accra or Kumasi or New York or London. It's the will of God. Because when you are in the will of God, every location is a good location. You know, so uh, learning to design that is, is, is for me the most important. Uh, I don't minimize uh, doing all our assessments of uh, what we have and what we can do and, um, and all of that. But I think if you get the will of God thing right and you add all of this, your decision-making becomes more effective as a Christian. I really like the point about the will of God making you prosper in any location. Mm -hmm. I think we'll speak to so many people listening to us today. Yeah, yeah. You have been watching Time with Pastor Otabel. It's been insightful and exciting so far. Remember that there are three decisions you should make. What you do with God your career, and whom you marry. We will take a short break. We'll be back in a jiffy. Be blessed by the 11 Word broadcast every weekday at 12.35 p.m. on Joy FM and at Shuttle Times on partner media platforms. Hi, with Pastor Otabel now airs every Thursday at 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. 
on our various online platforms at Mensa Otabel and at ICGC Christ. We're also now on TV3 on Sundays at 6 p.m. and on partner media platforms at various scheduled times. Join us as Pastor Otabel provides scriptural perspectives to the salient issues of life. Welcome from the break, and we are going to look at the consequences of our choices. And I want you to get your friends involved, call somebody to call somebody, and let them be part of this discussion. Their lives will never be the same again. Doc, there are some choices that we make that has generational effects. So if somebody makes such a choice, what can be done to reverse it? Ah, uh, hmm. I, th- I think you have to be aware that somebody's decision has disadvantaged you. Uh, and if it is so, uh, then you have to consciously work against it. And I'm thinking maybe uh, you come from a home where your father set a bad example in marriage. So probably mistreated your mother uh, was unfaithful uh, and all of that. And and when you were young, made you to feel, you know, as a man, you know, a man must not allow a woman to rule him and put all these ideas into you. So his decision is now being transferred to you. Then you grow up and realize your value system has been shaped by these bad choices of your father. And the sad thing is your father in his Later old age may even say, I'm sorry for the way I live my life. But then the effects are stuck with you. So if you find yourself following that path, you have to stop and say, these things I'm doing, this is the root cause of it. And I feel that is where our Christian life comes in. So you're going to go to God and you're going to ask him to break that spirit uh, and its control over your life. You're going to talk to somebody who is a mature Christian uh, to help you, to mentor you, uh, to be accountable to the person, to help you to overcome this consequential uh, situation that, that you are in. So uh, we, we have to audit our lives constantly, constantly audit your life to see where things you do are coming from. And, uh, and, and then go back and reverse them. And in Christ, we can do that. We can, and we, we can do it in prayer. We can do it in submitting to the word of God. And, and we can do it by uh, also following Christian counsel. Look, I then get the impression that we are basically a sum total of all the influences that we have had. We are. Life. We are. Um, I mean, we are in Christ spiritually, but our, our bodies and our minds came from the world. And that is why the renewal of mind is the, probably the number one occupation of the believer to put on the mind of Christ, to put on Christ. Uh, that is all we are doing in our Christian life, to replace the old with the new in our mind. The new is in our spirit, but the old is in our mind, which needs replacement. Uh, from the word of God and, and stay, stay in the word of God and allowing Christ to be formed in us. I really like that. Mm-hmm. The renewal of the mind is yes. the number one preoccupation. Yes, of the it should be. It should be. I would never forget this. So have the other scenario where it's not um, something that happened in the family, but it's a decision taken by somebody else that affects you big time. How do you handle that one also? Human beings affect human beings. All of us are affected by people. Even decisions that our government takes without us being a part of it affects us. Decisions taken by the city council affect us. Decisions taken by our teachers affect us. Decisions taken by our doctor whom you went to see for yeah. treatment affects you. You know, so in, 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 in the world, the, you realize that as much as uh, you're trying to live your life the best way. Other people's decisions can also interfere in your processes. And uh, it's a battle we have to fight constantly. I believe that the will of God and your will 
submitted to the will of God will defeat any other will that wants to interfere in your life. Sounds very nice. Sounds very powerful. <laughs> Look, for many people, when they make a mistake, what they do after the mistake often ends up being even worse than the mistake. What would you say to somebody who says, the year is just a few days old and I've made one terrible mistake already? First, it's good that <laughs> you know you've made a terrible mistake. Um, it, you can't solve these things long distance, as I always say. But I would, I would say if the person is a Christian, is in a good church, has a sober-minded pastor, sober-minded pastor, then talk to your pastor. If you have a haughty-minded pastor who doesn't take time to listen and to understand what people are going through and probably will just demonize the problem and uh, just try to consign a spiritual solution, they may not help you. you they, they may prescribe a solution that is not the answer because people's problems are not as simple as we want them to appear. Some, some of them are habits formed over a very long time. So although the person just did it uh, this January, the seeds have been sown since 1970 and has been building up and probably is a repeated pattern and this is just the newest version of it uh, we, we found. So I can't just deal with what just happened without understanding what has been happening. So is it a habit change that a person needs to go through? Then they need to be counseled and helped in, in a kind of an accountability relationship to start managing their habits better and overcoming the bad habits. So uh, it, 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 you, you need to understand what, what, what has happened and where it is coming from. Would you recommend professional therapy in instances? Yes, um, Unfortunately, in our part of this world, uh, counseling, professional counseling, professional therapies are not encouraged. You know, we, there's a stigma about going to see a, a counselor, um, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, uh, because once you do that, people think, you know, you think I'm mad. You know, <laughs> so, uh, but, but sometimes that's what we need because... The, the issues we are dealing with, some might, might be chemical imbalances in our brain, just like there can be a problem with any part of your body. Your brain can have a chemical imbalance uh, that needs to be corrected, and it can be corrected sometimes with good medication. And it's, it's, it's for me, once it sol solves your problem and it doesn't have any ethical issues about it, as a Christian, you, you, are, you allow that help. And some require some deep counseling. Uh, pastors are not, by their calling, full-time or properly trained counselors. We, we, we do simple counseling, you know, little things by understanding human behavior. But when the issues are very big, then we need a professional counselor. And uh, if there's anything I pray for, uh, well, one of the things I pray for is that God will raise Christian counselors, professional Christian counselors, for Christians, uh, because a lot of the issues Christians are dealing with are beyond their pastors. Although they go to the pastors for solution, they are beyond the pastors. They, they need a professional help, and, and we need Christian professionals who understand their job and are able to help Christians deal with these, these problems that they have. I guess the pastors must also sometimes admit that the issues are beyond them. <laughs> yeah, pastors must know. We can give a general oversight and, and a general view of it. Um, I mean, th there are problems I can have a, a sense of, but I can't really help a person deal with. But I can have a sense, this is what I think uh, is happening. And I have recommended so many people for Christian counseling, for, uh, for psychologists to deal with them. I mean, we, we try to work very close with some select uh, Christian uh, psychologists and uh, psychiatrists and, and therapists and counselors uh, and recommend people uh, for further help because we can't solve all of humanity's problems. I mean, it doesn't make us weak. It's just real. We can't solve everybody's problem. That is very critical. Mm. You know, pastors being able to refer 
people to professionals to help them. You know, instead of giving some form of counseling, that may not be exactly right. Yeah, I mean, the pastor is like a clearing house. You know, all of society's problems end up with a pastor. Almost every problem. Uh, People go to the pastor for all kinds of issues. But the fact that they end up with you doesn't mean you must solve all of them. Some of them you must refer. But you are the clearing house. People come and say, oh, this is the problem I'm having with my land. You know you can't solve the land problem. Refer them to a lawyer. Uh, yeah, this is a problem I'm having with my, my sickness. You pray for them. Refer them to a doctor. Things come to us, but we must know that we can't solve everything that comes to us. But, Doc, um, what could be the reason why a pastor wouldn't want to refer an issue to a professional? I could be the pastor's training. Uh, if he's been trained to spiritualize every problem, um, then that's what he's going to spiritualize the problem. And when we know we can't deal with something, God has other ways of solving the problem. And he has trained people who can solve the problem. We can refer to them. So can we take a minute or two to talk about guilt? If somebody is going through or carrying the burden of a guilt because of the effect of a bad choice that he made in the past and its replications on other people, how how could such a person be helped? I mean, I can answer it from the biblical point of view. Uh, God's solution to guilt is several levels. First, uh, it's his willingness to forgive us and and his mercy. Uh, The the mercies of God are called the tender mercies of the Lord. It means that God has deep feeling for us. So his mercy is important. He's willing to forgive. Uh, and so we go to him for forgiveness. But the Bible also tells us that we should confess our sins one to another. So sometimes the way of dealing with guilt is to confess what you have done, is to verbally speak to somebody. And sometimes to, a, to the person you need to confess too, because the guilt may not be that God has not forgiven you, but the guilt is that you see the person You have hurt and offended constantly and something within you doesn't agree with with you. That's where the guilt is coming from. So you may have to talk to the person. Uh, And um, I believe that God has a way of helping us. But if it is a deeper thing, uh, you may need professional help uh, because people carry guilt sometimes from when they were in nursery school and primary school. And, and they haven't forgiven themselves for something they did. And they, they're carrying it, and it's hurting them and hurting their relationship with others. And, Doc, sometimes they feel that the mistakes they have made is fatal and aborts their, their destiny. They feel the mistake they have made yeah. is fatal. Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, it depends on what they think the mistake is. The, the, the thing about these situations is that sometimes a problem can loom very large in your own mind and the reality may not be it. And you may assume something which is not so. And you may even assume that somebody will kill you if he gets to know something. But the person may have moved on with their life. So, and, and that's why you also need a professional uh, to talk to, to assess what the source of the guilt is and, and, and what to do with it. But um, as for God, uh, his mercy endures and, and we can go to him and he will forgive us. But sometimes uh, we also need a human being to forgive us. So, Doc, thank you so much for this insightful thoughts. And my colleagues, Pastor Albert and Pastor Prisla. Thank you. Dr. Sabel, please take us home. Well, I mean, we've talked a lot. I mean, the discussion has been wide from choices to habits, and we ended with guilt and what to do with it. Um, God loves you, and that is settled. And God's mercy is always towards you, and that is settled. And God wants to help you, and that is settled. But that doesn't solve every problem of your life, because God has given us a will. And we must use our will to, to come into agreement with God's purposes for our lives. So I, my prayer for you today 
is that God will help you to submit your will to him, that he would give you a heart that yields to him, a heart that submits to him, and a heart that honors him. So, Father, I pray for everyone listening to me that you give us, Lord, a true heart that is broken and contrite, and a true heart that yields to you, and a true heart that serves you and submits to you. And may our will always be subject to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll catch you again next week.